our vision at MBM is to see lives transformed through Jesus Christ to the glory of God the Father. We share God's love to the multicultural West of Sydney. By sharing Jesus, He gave us His best when we were at our worst. There are 60 different cultures represented in our church. We see this as a taste of heaven itself. We long to see people rejoicing in God's forgiveness instead of suffering in guilt and shame. God wants to change us for His glory and our good. God's way, it's the best way. And that even suffering helps us to know God better. We want to make lives better now. While never forgetting that the best is yet to come. It is our passion to grow in the fruits of the Spirit. Beginning with the greatest. Which is love. We seek to present each other mature. When Jesus comes in His glory. Our heroes are ordinary people. We put Jesus first. We may not always be what we want to be. But we know we are not what we used to be. We refuse to believe the lie that we are wiser than God. At MBM, the Bible will always have the final say. We want to prayerfully depend on the Holy Spirit. Our goal is to serve all people in every age and stage of life. We welcome all who come. But always on God's terms. We are eager to nurture the gifts of the Spirit. God gave us His best, so we need to give Him our best. We need each other. To fulfill God's calling for MBM. We long to impact our nation with love and truth. To speak up for those who cannot speak up for themselves. The kingdom of God is bigger than us. Which means working together to bring the message of grace to the nations. We seek to bless by planting churches. We have reaped where others have sown and others will reap where we have sown. Along the way, it is important that we enjoy life and delight in God's good creation. <laughs> And when it's all over, we believe that we have done nothing more but just our duty. We want our greatest joy to be God's glory. I call upon you to partner with us and make this vision your own. Our vision at MBM is to see lives right, transformed you can stop it there. through Jesus. Well, I love that that video there. I think it's a great, just a great visual of our text that we're going to be looking at here in Colossians 3, and, and really a great visual of what God is doing, what his purposes are that we're going to see in this text, that all around the world, his multi-ethnic family that he's drawing to himself, and, and what a beauty it is when it comes together in unity for God's glory. And so we're going to be looking at a passage that was written um, to a church in the area of modern Turkey, Colossae. These are Muslim lands today, but in, in Bible times, Jews and Europeans and Africans and others had all converged in the Roman Empire in the church. And there was long-standing division and racism that was overcome in the first century church by the sufficient Savior and his gospel. And I love even seeing the visual of that and seeing how our Middle Eastern Messiah unites people from every skin shade and age and stage of life. Look with me at Colossians 3, verse 11. Speaking of the church, it says, Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all. And in all. And I want to look at the context. If you go back into verse 10, because we need to get kind of a running start here, and this is how the New American Standard says it we put on the new self. This is this new person in Christ, this, this new church who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created it, a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, and, and it goes on there, and that, that's language like Romans 12, verse 2, we're to be renewed, the renewing of our mind is, is where the, the change needs to take place. We need to be transformed, not according to the pattern of this world and its category, this world has its own ways of categorizing and, and looking at people, but we're to, to not be conformed to the patterns of the way this world thinks, we're to be transformed by the renewing of our minds to the way God thinks and what he says. And all people groups, all pride, all prejudice must bow before Christ 
preeminence. And that's really the theme of the, the book. Christ's preeminence is the theme of Colossians. And now he brings it to a head in this section here. And as we recognize God's plan for this world and even diversity, it's, it's not that when we become Christians, we, we're now blind to color or blind to culture. In fact, God intentionally designed this diversity. I was just looking at the beautiful colors of the leaves as I came in here, and, and God has created a world with all of these different diversities and even colors and even the different cultures that, that they are actually to have us notice those things and then glorify Him for those, but not to look at those things in a, in a negative light. The, the, we're not blind to those things, but they're not barriers in Christ. And if anything, in Christ, we can actually have closer fellowship to those we never would naturally or ethnically because of what we have in Christ. And so when we're renewed with this true knowledge, there's no distinctions that bring divisions. And so here's some of the other translations. In that renewal, there is no longer Greek or Jew, or another says, in Christ, there is not, or, or when this happens... Or in this state, there cannot be Greek and Jew. In other words, there cannot be in the sense that there is divisions between these people groups. So here's a dynamic equivalent or thought-for-thought translation. In this new life, it doesn't matter if you are Jew or Greek, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free. Christ is all that matters, and He lives in all of us. That's speaking to Christians. Or the paraphrase by J.B. Phillips says, In this new man of God's design, there is no distinction between Greek and Hebrew, Jew or Gentile, foreigner or savage, slave or free man. Christ is all that matters, for Christ lives in all of his people. And so these phrases in this verse, to kind of get the big picture here, they cover divisions like, racism or religious background or reputation or rank in society. And so color in those days wasn't as much of a big deal as culture and, and other norms of, of society in those days. But we could think of ethnicity or externals or education or economics. Externals would include things of circumcision. Education would be the, the barbarians who were not educated. And the economics, certainly being a slave or free, greatly impacted that. But there's divisions even along these lines in different areas that continue to this day. Still, some may wrongly judge others by education, whether homeschool or or public, or charter, or some combination, or, or by externals, or, or maybe by religious traditions, or just, just, it could even be your background that relates to music styles, or your strong convictions about masks, or meeting decisions, or, or whatever it might be. There, there's all kinds of ways that we can divide based on making judgments about others, based on the outside. But in this text here, he starts with some of the divisions that were prominent in this church. Greeks, maybe they're listed first because the the Greeks actually saw themselves as first, uh, not just implicitly, explicitly in, in what they would say. They saw themselves as better than others. And the barbarians, they gave them that term because they didn't speak Greek, and they were considered unsophisticated. And the Scythians were the most uncivilized. So the -the run-of-the-mill barbarians, when they would look at the Scythians, they would really see them as outside. So there's all kinds of things that, that we can think about that can divide and that Paul was concerned about in this church. But what he's wanting to do in this text is call them to unite in Christ as their all in all, to focus on him. And Paul writes this as a Jew. He mentions Jews and circumcision. That was something they prided themselves in and their religion that that made them separate from others. And so Paul is writing this as a Pharisee. One of the prayers that is recorded from history that the Pharisees would pray daily was, God, I thank you that I am not born a Gentile or a slave or a 
woman. Pharisees weren't married, by the way, and maybe that was a factor. I don't know, but just imagine praying that prayer. Thank you, God, I'm not a woman with, with a, a wife. Probably would not go over real well. But this was, this was the culture that Paul grew up in. And the Pharisees saw themselves as better than other Jews. So it wasn't just an ethnic thing. They, they saw themselves as better, but now Paul has been saved from all that. Paul is now writing of God's new family that transcends slavery and ethnic partiality and puts our identity in our relationship to Christ. That's what matters. That's what we need to see. And so in verse 12, he says the church is God's chosen people. That was a phrase that was used of the Jews in the Old Testament, but now he's saying to the church that you're God's chosen people. And in the NIV, verse 12 calls them dearly loved, dearly loved or beloved people. These are the Gentiles, largely this church was a Gentile church, and Jews in Israel, some of them actually called Gentiles dogs. But now Paul is writing, someone changed by God's grace, writing of these Gentiles as dearly loved. He lived his life for and laid his life down for Gentiles who he was taught growing up to be separate from. And if you go back to chapter 1, I want you to notice how this book starts. Chapter 1, verse 2, begins to the saints and faithful brothers. He's not writing, he's not calling them Scythians or savages, as their world called them. To the saints, and, and not to the filthy barbarians, that's actually a, a title the world had for some of these who were in the church. He says, to the faithful brothers. And we need to understand there was deep in New Testament times, deep hostility and alienation between nations. There were evil deeds of, of racism. You could also classify it under nationalism and tribalism. It's been going on since the times of Genesis. It just looks different in different ways, but this has been in the heart of man. This is nothing new to our day and age, but they saw slaves as inferior, and, and those who were Greek by, by descent or by culture, they, they saw that their culture was supreme over all others. But Paul is writing in Colossians 1.18 at the end of the verse to say that Christ has supremacy over everything. And into verse 19, look at Colossians 1.20, says, it's talking about through Christ, God will reconcile to himself all things. So God's plan is for all things to be reconciled on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, he's speaking now to these Christians who once were alienated and hostile in mind. This was how they were before Christ. Doing evil deeds. Remember, he's writing to these people groups in chapter 311. You, he says, you were once alienated, hostile, doing evil. God has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death. This is gospel reconciliation that makes us right with God, but doesn't leave us there. It's also to address our relationship with others. And so Colossians 3.11 says, There is not Greek and Jew. These were ways they were still, in their culture, dividing themselves. Circumcised and uncircumcised. Barbarian, Scythian, slave, free. But Christ is all and in all. Last time we looked at the Thanksgiving verses in Colossians 3. as a part of our national holiday of Thanksgiving we also need to spend some time in verse 11 on the national hurt of this year as well. In God's timing, this is where he has us. And in this year, back in February, Ahmad Arbery, a black jogger in Georgia, killed by whites. You saw the headlines chasing him down in their pickup truck with their guns, saying, according to testimonies, and texting racist slurs, even as he was lying there and dying. We've seen the news and the aftermath, of course, of George Floyd in June in Minnesota, and in the months since, there has been an, an overflow of racial tensions that have been building for decades. 
And maybe the question comes up, why study Colossians 3.11 if we're up here in the mountains, you know, away from cities and away from the diversity? Well, I think, first of all, we need all of God's Word, but maybe especially for subjects that are, may tend to be more out of sight and more out of mind. As we go through books of the Bible, verse by verse, all Scripture is profitable, but sometimes what may be more uncomfortable is actually the most needful. And this next text really speaks to events of this year, and, and it, it speaks originally to deep ethnic tensions in Paul's time. And they had been building, not just for decades, but for centuries. And the answer for all time that Paul and God inspiring him wants us to have is that Christ as our all in all needs to inf impact how we think about other peoples. And so this is a subject we can't ignore, first of all, because it's in the text. We can't just move on to the next verse. But as we teach through the Bible section by section, it never ceases to amaze me how it speaks to our world. And it helps us know, and this is part of my heart here, to, to help us know how to speak to our world and about our world as we have opportunity, and ultimately how to speak the gospel into conversations when we're able to have them where the gospel is often completely left out, even by the way some Christians speak about this. And so Colossians 3.11 is not about politics, but it is about people. And it relates to prejudice, and it relates to the power of Jesus that healed great tensions in the first century, and still can in the 21st century. And, and maybe you, and I hope this is true for most, if not all of us, maybe you have no ill will towards anyone based on skin color, or can't even think of a time where you might have practiced injustice personally. But we need to recognize we can all internally judge others externally. And it's not just about hate. There's other ways that we can even hurt unintentionally. And I think we also need to be aware of indifference or ignorance or insensitive words. We should all have the heart of Psalm 139 to pray, Lord, see if there's any offensive or hurtful way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Even as we come to communion, we're, we're to examine ourselves. That's one way to examine our, our hearts and to how we're thinking about others. And so we'll look at verses 12 through 15 more later in another message. But just the, the first part of it I want you to point out in verse 12 starts with calling God's chosen, beloved people to put on compassionate hearts. This is something we have to put on. This isn't just natural for us to have compassion for others who we maybe can't relate to some of the struggles they've been going through. And this is really, I think it flows right out of verse 11. Compassion is an empathy and it's a sympathy. And in this context, there, he just mentioned some people groups that had faced hostility. And so it's, it's one thing to to listen to a conservative talk show host taking apart the liberals and how they're approaching this. But it's another thing for us to actually put on compassionate hearts for hurting people that we might talk to or how we even talk about these things. And, and we need to recognize we don't have diversity in our community like the video that I showed you. Our, our area here, I was looking up the statistics, is 90-some percent white, 0-point-some percent black, a small percent Asian, Hispanic, and some other people groups. But there is a growing number, and there's also people in our church and, and those growing up here, and, and all of us in, in a world that has a very liberal worldview on this subject. And I think the church needs to be a place for conversations and a place for compassion. And I've heard people in our church say they don't see racism, and, and we're a majority people, and so we need to, first of all, recognize, I'll go back to the question, is this needed in our community? Well, we're in Northern California, maybe you're thinking. We're not in the Southern United States. Well, our church name, Gold Country, reminds us of the gold rush that started here, and really that California's founding had a lot to do with that, as people from Europe and 
even South America and Asia all came together in a melting pot, many of them seeking a pot of gold initially, and the, the melting pot, of course, even part of that image is sometimes that melting pot boils over. And we need to reckon with the reality that racism in California led to the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act that kept Chinese laborers out of this country just by ethnicity it, from 1882 until 1943. And then they started to allow some immigrants back from China, but just a, a few a year, and there were some political reasons and relations in World War II that related to that. But in that same time and decade during that war, California led the way in the forcing of Japanese into internment camps just for being Japanese. And maybe you're thinking, well, that's, that's history. That's a long time ago. Well, five months ago, a South Bay Japanese shop owner found this on his door. Go back to where you belonged. Go back to Japan, you and then they put a racist animal slur I'm not even going to read. We are going to bomb your store if you don't listen. Here is America. And you can tell even in the way it was written and even in the grammatical errors, the, the ignorance, but also the, the hatred coming out to this person. But let's come closer to home. Talk about our own county and our own community. Up until eight years ago, there were tombstones not far from here with the N-word chiseled into them for unknown, and then they, they gave a, a racial slur there. This was, they were put there in, in many of our lifetimes who were in here, and, and they were segregated. You, could, you literally could not, if you were of a different, not just blacks, but Chinese and others, you could not be caught dead in a white cemetery. And I say that not by, to make light of it at all, but, it, but to, to recognize that reality. Let's go just four years ago in El Dorado Hills, a homeowner filling out their CCRs for a, a neighborhood read this as they were signing it, and it had been there for decades. No person except those of the white Caucasian race shall use, occupy, or reside upon any residential lot or plot in this subdivision except when employed in the household of a white Caucasian tenant or owner. And that hit the news. It had been there on the book since the 1960s, but that also shows how few noticed that till that 2016 controversy. Just this year, there were uh, about 20 young black entrepreneurs touring a, a neighborhood in that same community, and social media posts came out that the rioters are here. Second Amendment call out there, get your guns. How about 2018, local business in Placerville had a Colin Kaepernick doll hanging by its neck from the ceiling. If you don't know who that is, that was the black, a black player who started protests against racism. And this is what the owner of that store told a local TV station. I literally had no idea I was offending people. With the theme of Hangtown, I hung him. In July of this year on Placerville Main Street, there were flyers for a white nationalist group that were placed out on the front of shops. The shop owners didn't want those there, but someone had been putting those out there. And in the front of our county courthouse here that same month, I'm told there's footage of racial epithets being shouted at a, at a protest. Just this week, while I was working on these notes, I saw a headline of a 14-year-old black student's family suing a local school for racist taunts and bullying that have been happening continually by text and verbally for two years, at least according to the, to the allegation. Recently, a Chinese friend of someone in our church was at a local Raley's, and a stranger came up and shouted to them to go back to China and said something along these lines, I'll buy you a ticket to Wuhan. That should grieve us when we, when we hear that sort of thing as Christians. These are the sort of things, I, and I've appreciated some people here have just confessed 
struggle. Uh, someone shared with me a while back, I, I struggle when I see people in traditional Arab dress just because of all that's going on in the world. I don't want it to be that way, but, I, but pray for me. That's a, that's a struggle. Uh, but there's times where I've heard black culture equated with a, a victim mentality and, and had to talk to someone, fellow Christian, about that privately. I've, I've heard people here speak negatively of, of Mexicans or even certain businesses they don't uh, support or buy from because they feel they're tied in with some, something else. And it also goes both ways. A black sister in Christ confessed that she used to, before Christ, really dislike and really kind of hate white people. But the Lord had changed her heart in that. I was having lunch with a black pastor in Sacramento some years ago, and he shared, and again, this was just kind of eye-opening, something I hadn't really had to wrestle with. He shared growing up, his dad wasn't allowed to become a member of the Presbyterian church that they, that they attended. He loved the Reformed tradition, but he couldn't take communion in it, and that wasn't limited to certain types of churches. John Piper remembers growing up, blacks couldn't even attend a wedding, couldn't even be a visitor or an attender in the back at a wedding at their church, and his mom wasn't having that, and she went and she ushered them in. But that caused quite a stir, as you could imagine. And just in, even in the time frame when I was born, or a few years before that, many Southern Baptist churches did not allow people of different ethnicity, and their policies may have changed on paper, but heart change can take longer. And in the denomination I grew up in, the GARBC, there were like-minded black regular Baptists who wanted to join the fellowship, but they weren't allowed. They were actually kept segregated. And I'm told that interracial couples weren't allowed in ministry and missions even into the 19. 80s in some of those circles, and in 1996, the leaders of that group that I grew up in confessed and began fellowship with the Black Baptist Network, but we're talking about that was when I was 21 years old, and in the 21st century, at our church, someone told me about a, a family member years ago who experienced racism at this church. Things have, have been said that I don't even want to say here, but someone who used to be at our church years ago left, and a chief complaint was people adopting from different ethnicities, and this person used language I could not believe and will not repeat. And so this is a real problem, even though it may not be on our radar of regular experience, and there's not a superficial answer for this, but the solution to this problem must begin where Paul ends this verse in Colossians 3, 11. But Christ is all and in all. Christ needs to be all and in all. And so let's dig a little deeper into the Greek, the Jew, the circumcised, the uncircumcised, because I think studying more of this context where Paul wrote this actually gives us hope for our context. The superior Greek culture had been forced on the Jews by those who conquered them and enslaved them at times. We, you could study that out in, in history under Antiochus, Epiphanes, but the, the Jews also kind of returned the favor. The, the circumcised Israelite despised the, the Gentile. They wouldn't eat with them. They wouldn't even buy meat from Gentile butchers. Uh, when they would pass through Gentile land, some of them would actually shake the Gentile dust off their clothes to make sure there was nothing contaminating them from the Gentile lands. This is the culture Paul grew up in, and this is what the gospel broke down. Galatians 5, 6 says, in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Or he says in chapter 6, what counts, what matters is a new creation. So it's not about 
being religious or just doing religious things. What matters is the regenerating work of God, the, the heart change that God does. The value is faith in Christ. That's what counts in salvation. It's not about being a, a good person. It's about believing a gracious person named Jesus, the only one who was good enough for us, because none of us are good enough to get to heaven, but he, he was given, he was good enough. He lived the good life we could not live, the perfect life we could not live to please God. And if you've never understood that, if you have never come under Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior, you can turn from your sin today and you can trust him to save you and to change you and to be your all in all. As the song says, to be your strength when you're weak, the treasure that you seek, you are my all in all. So that even when you fall down, he'll lift you up. When you're dry, he'll fill your cup. He, he can be your all in all. Romans 3. Are we Jews any better off, Paul says? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. There is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by grace as a gift. Is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles? There is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. And Paul said, I am eager to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome, and including to the barbarian. What were these barbarians? This is an onomatopoeic poetic word, if you remember that from school. It's, it means it sounds like what it says. It's trying to convey something by the actual word. So bar, bar, uh, you think of like their language to the Greeks. They couldn't understand them, so it was like, you're just saying bar, bar, uh. It's like we might say blah, blah, blah. I think of Charlie Brown's teacher, right? He's him or whoever, one of the kids, the teacher's talking. The child can kind of hear them and understand them. But to the, to the TV show or to the audience listening, it's just blah, 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 blah. That's, that's how they, they made up a word for these people who just couldn't speak Greek, so it was just like bar, 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 bar. But they were uneducated in the superior Greco-Roman culture and ways of life. They were thought uncultured and uncouth, and they probably were tending to be more unclean than others. But they were seen as crude, coarse, boorish, like beasts, maybe like some teenage boys today, I don't know, but, but it was deeper than that. Plato said the barbarians are our enemies by nature. And Paul was compelled to minister the gospel to them. He says, I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, to the wise and to the foolish, the ignorant, the uneducated. He says, I am eager to preach the gospel. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes to the Jew first and also what? To the Greek or to the Gentile. Here's what a second century writer, so the maybe a hundred years after Paul wrote Colossians, Epistle to Diognetus said, as, as this new worldview was spreading, Christians, this is what stood out about Christians, Christians are distinguished from other men, neither by country nor language, inhabiting Greek as well as barbarian cities. They love all men. They loved all, and that stood out. Even the Scythians, those that were seen as the most savage they were seen as ferocious terrorists. So whatever stereotype you have of a, a terrorist today, that's how they saw the, the Scythians. And they had, a Greek historian said, they had the most filthy habits. They never washed with water. And so one church father, Tertullian, he could think of no greater insult to a heretic Martian than to say that he was more filthy in his doctrine than any Scythian was in his body. But here we have in Christ's church this people group being singled out and stated explicitly that there's no place for any cultural contempt among peoples and individuals, even those wild, repulsive Scythians. And another writer says, for, for Christians, the word barbarian was struck out of their language, and it was actually went out of the dictionary of mankind, and it became replaced by the word 
brother in Christian circles. They didn't call them barbarian, the barbarian section or people over here. They called them brothers. And they were all together under Christ who was their all in all. In fact, this idea of mankind as one family, the, the children of God as one, is an idea that is explicitly from Scripture. It was not from any other ancient culture. The Bible is clear. There are no races you realize that racism, the whole premise of different races treating each other differently is, 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 is bad biblically, but also bad science because there are not different races. We are all one race. That's true biblically and it's true biologically. All God's family, we go deeper in Christ, all God's family is one in Christ. And it can be even deeper than even your biological blood relatives. Our unity in Christ. So John Piper says, the point of Colossians 3.11 is not that cultural, ethnic, and racial differences have no significance. They do. The point is that they are no barrier to profound, personal, intimate fellowship. He gives this example. We think about choir practice Tuesday. Singing alto is different from singing bass. It's a significant difference. But that difference is not a barrier to being in the choir. It's actually an asset. It's actually a wonderful thing. When they come together, God has designed diversity that we're not all the same. And it's a wonderful thing. And so the last two people groups at Colossians 3.11, slave and free, we're going to talk more about those. I think we need to give that more time in verse 22 when we get to slaves and masters. We need to understand that because that was a big division in the first century. And it was slavery in American history was even worse and was different in a number of ways, but we'll talk about that in another message. But what is the hope for racism, for division? Again, it's at the end of verse 11. Christ is all and in all. The way the world talks about racial hate or wrong doesn't seem to bring peace. If you notice that, the more things have been talked about in the way the world does, peace isn't really being fostered. There's not a lot of goodwill in a lot of the conversations, whether online or even on the media about this with different talking heads. We sang the song earlier, in despair, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said. Do you ever think that? Do you ever see the news and just bow your head? For hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill toward men, but then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor does he sleep. The wrong shall fail. The right will prevail with peace on earth, goodwill toward men. It can be discouraging to watch the news, but we need to remember there is good news of great joy that is for all peoples that that we celebrate this time of year. This is, Christmas is about God and sinner reconciled. And then because of that, we can be reconciled to each other. Christ is sufficient over man's divisions and and racism, and his gospel brings peace on whatever would divide people. It brings peace to those on whom his favor rests, who his grace comes upon, a grace that can change strong hate to love. It's to us, we, we read earlier, it's, it's to all of us that a child is born. To us, a son is given. And part of his name is the Prince of what? The Prince of Peace. And so think about this as we prepare for this Advent and Christmas season. The wise men from the Orient, from the East, where the, that's modern Iraq or Iran or, or, or Arab lands, they come to, to bring treasures to this king there's a Christmas announcement of, of this is for all the, all the people. This is peace for the earth. And that message first came to the uneducated and the unclean, most unclean people around Bethlehem, shepherds, who were kept segregated from their society and whose testimony wasn't even allowed in court, even as we think of many other groups weren't allowed to give testimony in court, even in California in the 1800s, well, shepherds were not allowed to give testimony in court, so they could, they could tell the story to others, but people wouldn't believe them. And yet, this is the ones that God brings that message to, and Mary and Joseph were poor peasants. They were despised 
and oppressed by the Gentile Romans. And you remember, and as the story goes on, Jesus, as he's brought into the temple, Simeon comes and he lifts up this baby and says, this is a light to the Gentiles. This is the one that Isaiah was speaking about. And you remember, if you keep going on in the story in Matthew, Jesus and his family fled to Africa. They became refugees in, in lower Egypt. They had to live down in the, the corner of that continent until Herod died. And out of Egypt, the, the Son of Man came, and, and Matthew ties that in with what Hosea said. So like Israel, who came out of slavery and out of that bondage into the land, Jesus is, is representing his new people. And Jesus himself was mistreated. Jesus ministered to the oppressed in Luke 4, when he brings the gospel, that's who he's talking, about, talking to, the downtrodden, the oppressed, the afflicted, the outsiders. He actually would touch those who were unclean, that no one else wanted to get near. Jesus went to them. He touched them. He healed Gentiles, welcomed them into his family of faith, sometimes gave them greater praise than the people of Israel. And as Jesus went to the cross, he fell down, and a man from Africa, from Cyrene and North Africa, came and helped carry his cross. And as Jesus died on the cross there, a Gentile Roman centurion is confessing, this is the Son of God, and Jesus is shedding his blood that is just like all of ours. And he's ransoming people from every tribe, from every tongue, from every culture. And so Christ is all and in all. And he says to his beloved people, put on a heart of compassion. We need to see people as Christ does. We need to see the multitudes of confused and bewildered people who are hurting, who are like sheep without a shepherd. As we see those multitudes, it says Jesus was moved with compassion in his heart. As we see people who, who see problems but don't see the answer in Christ, our heart should be his heart of compassion. How can we tell others about this Christ, to put on his heart. When we see any person mistreated, I think we need to think of verse 10, the image of the creator. We need to think first and foremost that this is an image bearer of God. So when something horrible happens to someone, whatever their ethnicity, we need to think this is an image bearer of God who deserves better than that and to be treated with dignity. That's the key to see that we are all image bearers of God, all in his family. And this renewal in verse 10 is transforming the way we think to not the pattern of this world. And so putting on compassionate hearts means we need to seek to sympathize and empathize and learn from those who have suffered and gone through things that we haven't. And I would commend to you, and I, I think I'll put a, a blog link up today with some of the links that have been helpful for me on this journey, but there's some podcasts by Ligon Duncan, who many of us have heard at, at Shepherd's Conference, and they bring on many black brethren to talk about some of their experiences and how, how we can be more sensitive to these things. There's an article by Shai Lin that I think I'll link there as well, and, and also just right here in 20-some miles from here, a, a, a brother at Emmanuel Baptist Church uh, shared a podcast with Pastor Steve and and Robert there, just talking about his experience growing up in, in, in Sacramento and what he has experienced in terms of racism, and just to help us as Christians think through how we're speaking about these talking points that are on the news, because compassion is bearing one another's burdens. It's, the Bible says when one part of the body suffers, we should hurt with it. We should want to understand more. And Forgiveness is based on the power of the gospel in verse 13. And in verse 14, love is what binds us together in perfect harmony and unity. And so we'll need to unpack those a little bit later. But I want to I want to close for also us to just think about someone who you might notice who, who maybe is struggling with English, who's, who's come here from another country. I, I'm, I'm sensitive to this because I grew up in a country with a hundred million Filipinos and a few hundred Americanos, and there were times and settings where I, I didn't know their language real well, and, and when someone would come and help me, it was just such an encouraging thing to me. 
But think about those also who are struggling because of things in, in their past or present. And we, 1 Corinthians 12 talks about how we're all, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, we're all given the same spirit. And we're not to say to any part of the body that we don't need them or, or their perspective or think that we're indispensable and they're not and to treat them with different honor. It says God has designed the body, so think of the church, that there should be no division in the body but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. And Paul's saying we need them in the body and we need to feel their pain. And just one illustration this week that was a, a vivid illustration of, and actually compassion was part of the headline in the article, someone working on a physical body. Monday in Sacramento, there was a Jewish daughter, a doctor, a black and Asian nurse or some sort of combination there, and they were serving someone, saving someone who was dying, and as they opened him up, they saw they saw. KKK, neo-Nazi, you know, swastikas, tattoos all over the place, and he's lying there, and, and they, the, the doctor confesses, my compassion was tested in that moment. No, this is a Jewish doctor now, knowing, of course, people with that ideology were those who wanted to exterminate the Jews, and, and yet he, they, they served him, they did what they could to to save him, and I don't even know all the details of that story, but I, that word compassion jumped out at me. He says, this is, I feel like I'm a pretty compassionate person. This really tested my compassion, but they worked to save the life of this one who had, whose life had been so marked, literally marked by hate. But I want to close with the illustration going back to the year 1865, because it ties in with a communion service in the South. The headline from the Richmond Times Dispatch was Negro Communed at St. Paul's Church. And to the surprise and shock of this white church, there was a, a black gentleman who came down the aisle. They, they did their, serve their communion up in the front. And he knelt down. This is what one eyewitness there said. Its effect upon the communicants, that's the white congregation, was startling, and for several moments they retained their seats in solemn silence and did not move, being deeply chagrined. But there was a man present who walked up there and, in his usual dignified and self-possessed manner, went up to the aisle to the very front and reverently knelt down right next to this man to partake of communion together. That man was Robert E. Lee. This was 1865, shortly in the months, I believe, after the Civil War had ended. And, and the, the testimony of this person was seeing that person lead the way in, in reaching out in such, these are his words, such provoking and irritating circumstances had an amazing effect on the others who all went forward to the communion table. And this person says, I being one of the number did likewise. When we realize we're all the same at the foot of the cross, that the cross brings us all on the same level, that's the key. But we also need to be those who are willing to step into difficult and awkward situations to, to reach out to and to love others. May God help us as a church as his people, to be pursuing more of this vision that we have seen today. Amen? Amen. Let me pray. Our great God, we thank you for your great grace to us. It brings us on our knees to the foot of the cross where we are all sinners in need of grace. And Lord, we all have sin in our hearts towards people and it it may be very different than the kinds of sins we read about in Colossians 3, but Lord, there is, there is a great need for all of us in, in the way we think of and view others to be gracious people, to be cross and Christ-centered people. I pray that you would help us as a church, even in this time of communion now, 
that you would help us, if there's any offensive way in us as we examine ourselves, that you would help us examine our hearts. And if there's people we need to make things right with relationally, Lord, that we would pursue that. And Lord, we can divide for all kinds of things that aren't things Paul is talking about in this passage, Lord. I pray that we would not divide, that we would unite in Christ because of Christ and for Christ. And it's in his name we pray these things. Amen.